January, we preach through our discipleship system again. And one of the things we like to say, and we try to make it clear as visitors come in, is that at the camp, we, we picture following Jesus as something that's challenging, something that's not easy, it's not comfortable, but it is amazing. So we picture it like a long, difficult, but amazing hiking trail that you follow Jesus. And, and the point is not to reach the end of the trail or destination. The point is to die on the trail. And everyone said, Amen. We'll just let that sink in. As long as, I, as long as I don't settle, as long as I don't quit the trail, as long as I don't go down to the safety of the village, as long as I die on this trail, that's an overcomer. And so this January, we're going to do this again, talk about our discipleship system, our compass, and what it means, but we're going to do it with an emphasis upon the Holy Spirit. And so one of the things we're going to remember as we go through this, these several weeks together is that the Holy Spirit is the one who is with us on this trail. Not just with us, but burning inside of us. And that is really important as the game changer. And sometimes we don't give enough attention to that. I don't do that enough. So we're going to do that together. And we're going to remember, and we're going to discover, that it is the Holy Spirit who burns within us to worship. Would you say worship? It is the Holy Spirit who gives us the enablement to do family well. Would you say family? It is the Holy Spirit who equips us to help others in relationships. Would you say relationships? And all those are easy, right? That's normal church stuff until we get to this last one. But you notice on the, the compass, missions, taking the actual trail, that's the goal. And the last one is this, that the Holy Spirit emboldens us, emboldens us to take the trail of missions. Would you guys say missions? That's how we disciple at the camp. This is what we live for at the camp. Every week we practice worship, we practice family, we practice relationships, we practice missions, and then we start all over again the next week, and the week after that, and the month, and the month after that, and the year, and the year after that, and the year after that, until we die on the trail. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. And that's as good as it gets on this side of things but some of you already know that's pretty good that is pretty good but this January we're going to rediscover the spirit of the trail now if you're a camp member you have read our camp story about Stephen and Gray Castle and the crazy trail folk hippies you guys remember that you all said you read it anyway when you joined our church and usually in January, what we do is we read it dramatically a week, a chapter at a time. This January, you're actually going to see it dramatized in front of you, thanks to our friend Keith Frazier. So he has enlisted a few, he has enlisted a few actors, so we're going to take some time each week to watch this play out in front of us. So if we could dim the lights and if you could give, every, give them your attention. Wow, didn't they do a good job of that? Man, that's what we envisioned it as when we were reading it. Hey, every, super, super, I'm looking forward to this every single week. Thank you, guys. Man, it's a lot of work right there, too. Everyone, what was that presence in the room with Stephen that he didn't realize who he was talking to? Who is that quiet voice that pulls on us and draws us towards Christ? Who is that person? That's the Holy Spirit. And we don't often recognize him, and that's what we're doing in January. We're going to begin today. I'm not going to begin on worship today. We're going to go to that next week. Today, we're going to begin with the symbols of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is going to be different for us, but for most of us, we're pretty good at drawing, or can draw. And so I'm going to invite you, if you would, as you're taking some notes, to draw some pictures. Because here's what's interesting. If we begin to talk about Father God, 
most of you have a visual in mind, right, everyone? Because you, you had a dad. You could picture a good dad king, right, and light and mighty power, right? You could picture that in your mind. When we talk about Jesus, you could picture a Jewish man, can't you? But when we talk about the Holy Spirit, now we have a very difficult time picturing him. And so because of that, we make some mistakes. We call him it. We think he's a force. In fact, someone said there is a new trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Scriptures. And we've ignored the Holy Spirit as a person in many ways. So we're going to remedy that together. When you try to talk about the Holy Spirit, just like when you want to talk about other things that maybe they're not uh, concrete things. So you're, you want to describe them. Now you could use a bunch of technical language and bore everyone, or you could use metaphors. You could use figures of speech. Like right now, let's imagine that I ask every husband to turn to his wife and try to describe to her just how much he loves her using his words, right? Now, he could begin to say, he could try his best to explain it technically and scientifically and, and bore her to death, or he could say to her, my love for you is an ocean. It is the sky. Now, we've done two things. We have told her how much we love her, and we've moved her at the same time. You follow? So there's some places where technical languages fail. And when it comes to describing the Holy Spirit, often technical language fails. So instead of technical language, we have metaphors. We have symbols, and those say a lot. So today what I want to do is I want to give you three symbols that the Bible uses to talk about the Holy Spirit. And each one of these will communicate something special about the Spirit that I think will be helpful to you. These, these helped me as you begin to think about him and relate to him as this person dwelling inside of you. So let's begin with this one. The Spirit is a breath, so do not hold him. Would you say this with me? The Spirit is a breath, so do not hold him. There, let's go back one. The Spirit is a breath, so do not hold him. The word Spirit in the Old Testament Ruach in the New Testament, Numa, has a, a range of meaning that means breath, that means voice, in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. You have this overlap of wind, breath is kind of air, and also a voice. And so let me say these things. If you would turn to John chapter 3, I'm going to take you quickly through these first three symbols, and then we'll spend just a moment longer on the last one. If you would turn to John chapter 3, and we'll look at John 3, we'll, we'll bounce back to John 1. These will be familiar texts to you, so they won't need a whole lot of explaining. But in John chapter 3, the Spirit is a breath, so do not hold him. John chapter 3, when we are born again, we receive the Holy Spirit, who is like a breath. If you did not receive the Holy Spirit when you were born again, then you were not born again. The Holy Spirit isn't just a person that comes with the package of salvation. He is salvation inside of you. We'll talk more about that later. But when you prayed to receive Jesus, the Holy Spirit came to live inside of you, and he is like a breath. So, like breathing... He is always with us. You're always breathing. You're always breathing. And let that remind you of the breath of God that's inside of you. He sends, sometimes, sometimes he sends a breath of fresh air into us. Sometimes he fills our lungs until they stretch. And in those moments, he's doing something special in our lives. And here's an important part. He's helping us to do something beyond our capabilities. And he loves that. It, it excites him. This is what he is about. So when you decide that you're finally going to shut down that sin addiction in your life, and you risk it to do so, and you feel a filling of the Holy Spirit, and your lungs begin to stretch with his breath, it's because you're trying to do something now that is beyond your capabilities, and that's his wheelhouse 
at that point. But it, those are amazing moments. But like a wind, the Spirit is also mysterious. Jesus said in John chapter 3, verse 8, The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it. But you cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Now, we don't like this truth about the Holy Spirit because we, as Americans in the West, we want everything to be scientific, predictable. We want it to follow a method. And when the Holy Spirit doesn't do that, we take it the wrong way. We think, oh, something must be wrong, or what's wrong with him? Because we want to hold him to predictability, to method, to we, we know exactly what he's going to do at different times. And it's very frustrating to us to just go ahead and acknowledge the fact that he is a wind, he is a breath. You cannot control him, he's out of hand. He comes and goes as he wishes. Now the Bible makes it very clear, the Holy Spirit is comes on a believer and is always with you, just like you're always breathing. But then there will be times when he just fills your lungs until they almost explode. And it'll be exciting and invigorating and terrifying. But then you wish, why doesn't he always do that? Something must be wrong with me. Something must be wrong with him. We need to stop doing that and stop trying to hold him. Jesus said there is a mystery to him. He is allowed to be that way. He is sovereign after all. The Holy Spirit is a breath, so do not try to hold him and just go ahead and acknowledge that. He's not predictable. He's not methodical. He does what he, what he wants to do. He is a wind and cannot be controlled. But also like a breath, he is a whisper, isn't he? We wish he was a shouter, but he just won't shout. He has his own reasons for that. One of those is he's a gentleman. He's not going to shout. I mean, he is our very life. Why should he have to shout? But what that means is we're only going to hear him if we're quiet. And what's awful is we're surrounded by noise 24 hours a day. We pick up noise before we get out of bed. We have noise in our face while we go to bed. There's never a time anymore where we're quiet. But it's only in those quiet moments where we can hear his voice. So we think, well, he whispers. What is he, real, sim real timid? Is he mousy? Not at all. Because sometimes when a person whispers to you, it can cause something gigantic to happen, can't it? Like when uh, you hear a whisper, that pretty girl goes by. You've been thinking about her and praying about her a long time. You hear a whisper, today's the day. That's not a mousy person, right? That's not a timid person. She's mad at you. She's screaming at you. Smile and love her. I dare you. There he goes, that guy. Go share the gospel with that guy. I dare you to do it. Quickly turn the radio back up. <laughs> Get your mind on something else so you don't have to hear the whisper. And like a whisper, everyone, we can misunderstand. Most of the time when you whisper, I usually can hear you, but I still say, huh? Because I want to make sure I know what you said. I can easily misunderstand you, can't I, when you whisper. And that happens, and that's okay. That's okay. So the Spirit is a breath, so do not hold him. Instead, let's accept that he is always with us, just like we're always breathing. But sometimes he fills us until we're about to pop. And sometimes his wind blows upon us, and all we can do is unfurl the sails and be driven along, and then he decides to do something else. And that's okay. Would you say this with me? The Spirit is a breath, so do not hold him. One more time. The Spirit is a breath, so do not hold him. Here's the next one, real popular in Scripture. The Spirit is a dove, so do not upset him. Can you say this with me? The Spirit is a dove, so do not upset him. Now, you know where I'm going with this. And If you just turn backwards a page or two to John chapter 1. 
the Gospels record this. This is a really strong image that's used in John chapter 1, and uh, you know this. But at verse 32, uh, John the Baptist bears testimony, bears witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, like a dove, right? And he remained, that's a key word, he remained upon Jesus. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. The Spirit is a, is a dove. And like a dove, he, he, I guess doves and pigeons are closely related. You can't get rid of pigeons, right? They're in front of you, especially if people are feeding them. But you kind of would like to. Doves are much more beautiful, right? But they're also more easily startled. And so pigeons might stay around long after. People try to get rid of pigeons and put nails all over the ceiling, over the roof and the statues. Try to get rid of pigeons, right? It's not easy to do. But a dove is more easily startled. I don't know. Maybe they're cousins, right? But a dove doesn't always just hang around. A dove can be easily startled, fly away. But what happens in Jesus' life? The dove is always there. The dove remains. The power of the Spirit remains. So what we want to do is, I want to say it this way, that we might this time speak of the power of the Holy Spirit as a dove. Because we've talked before about how the Holy Spirit is a breath. He's always in you, just like you're always breathing. But then you watch, just like you especially think of the Old Testament, but also in the book of Acts, that the power of the Holy Spirit seems to just go from one person to another. You can't always predict why that is. Because he is he's like a dove, and he, is, uh, he can be upset. And so uh, that's, that's why this, this symbol, I think it's a really good one. The Spirit's power is like a dove, easily upset. It's not that he's, it's not that he's so sensitive. It's that he is urgent with his power. Now, if you remember the text in 2 Chronicles uh, 16.9, the eyes of the Lord range to and fro throughout the earth, looking for someone whose heart is fully devoted to him so that he can support them. This is the Holy Spirit's role. He is looking for people who are ready to risk something beyond their capability and then to give them the power to do that thing. So what, what that means about the dove is that basically if I'm living a boring Christian life, boring to the Holy Spirit, I'm only doing things I'm comfortable with, I'm only doing things that I think are prudent, I'm only doing things that are cautious, I would never take a risk, I would never go beyond my capabilities, and I justify every single one of those, that's a yawn to the dove, and the dove flies to someone else. So if that's me living that life and doing everything that's safe and predictable and cautious and prudent, and the ho- that grieves the dove, the dove wants to fly away to that pastor in India who continues to lead and preach to his congregation in spite of the fact that soon he's going to be arrested, taken from his children and wife and congregation, placed in jail, and forgotten. The spirit rushes the dove over to that person. And you see the power, the power of the spirit goes to that person. There is a dove-like quality. These are things, there are things that we do that upset or grieve the Holy Spirit. And you've read about these in scripture before. Ephesians 4, 30, to grieve the Holy Spirit, don't upset him. Bitterness, unrighteous anger, gossip, upset the Holy Spirit. He doesn't like it when we rebel against him. He doesn't like it when I ignore him. He doesn't like my selfish ambition. He doesn't like my sin habits. And honestly, he doesn't like my restless busyness. These are things that grieve him. But you remember that mission trip you went on when you were a teenager? Remember how excited you were? And you thought, man, I wish my whole life was a mission trip. And somebody said, well, you had a mountaintop experience there. Those are special. 
Maybe it was more like I was doing something beyond my capabilities that required the power of the Holy Spirit upon my life, and it was a great experience. And then I came back to doing nothing beyond my capabilities, right? When we stretch ourselves, and it might be not be anything as big as going on a mission trip. It might be something much smaller. Like we mentioned before, we're taking on something big. Maybe, maybe the Holy Spirit is telling us there's someone in this room that's speaking lie after lie after lie about the Bible, or lie after lie after lie about the unborn, or lie after lie after lie about something else, and the Spirit is whispering to us, you say so. Your hands start to get sweaty, right? In those moments, his power is ready to come upon us and not to make us stand up and be filled with magic, but to do what he did in the book of Acts. And Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak. He begins to preach the gospel, right? The Holy Spirit is like a dove. There are certain things that upset him and that grieve him, and so we can understand why we don't experience his power the way we would like to. But there's other things that he loves. He loves to stretch us. Oh, excites him. He loves church, everybody. Sorry, but he does. He loves church. He loves his word. You've discovered this. You read his scripture and you can't explain it, but something about it is good to your soul. Right? It's not just because the word of God is a, has a magical property to, to it. It's because that inside of you lives the author who's constantly saying amen to everything you read. He loves his word. He loves prayer. He loves singing throughout the New Testament. The Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit is, there is singing. He loves to sing. Do the things that he likes and expect to experience him, right? We don't want to do the other things that he dislikes and grieve him. The Holy Spirit is a dove, so do not upset him. I'm, I'm going to speak about this several times, but I really am going to give you a ton of things throughout this series and throughout this year, and I really want you to take them all. I know nobody reads anymore. I know that's going out of style, but I have a couple books for you, and this is one. It's a little devotional book, 40 Days with the Holy Spirit, and each, page, each devotional is only like two or three pages long. And there's a place for you to write. This might be a good experience finally in our lives, right, to make some progress in this way. So I encourage you to take a look at that. This is a devotional book. It's easy, easy reading, okay? Bitefuls. So let's start at the beginning. Would you read this with me? The Spirit is a breath, so do not hold him. The Spirit is a dove, so do not upset him. And here's the last, next one. The Spirit is a fire, so do not quench him. One more time, will you read this with me? The Spirit is a fire, so do not quench him. The Holy Spirit appears as fire in Acts chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Paul tells Timothy to fan into flame the gift of God in 2 Timothy 1, 6. God's word also warns us that we should not quench the Spirit. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19, the Spirit is a fire, so do not quench him. Instead, let us fan him into flame. We don't like that idea that there's a truth to that, that the, the Holy Spirit doesn't, oh, people say things that they shouldn't say about the Holy Spirit. It's, Holy Spirit, come and control me. The Holy Spirit doesn't control us. Demons control people. The Holy Spirit doesn't do that. The whole, one of the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. The Holy Spirit wants to come and burn inside of us. And he does that in different ways. And one of the ways he does that is by convictions. You ever experienced a conviction? It wasn't just your conscience. It was more than that. And you knew this particular thing was wrong. Or you knew this particular thing was right and you should do it. Those are convictions. And the Holy Spirit works through those convictions. But every time he begins to burn with a conviction and I say no, no, I pour water on, those, on that fire. I quench the Spirit. And once again, like breathing, he's always there, but you might just picture him, okay, I'll step back. Okay, you don't want a life in the Spirit? You don't want to be led by the Spirit? You can't hear my voice anymore? You do it then. Right. 
when he gives us these impulses and we say, oh no, no, that's not for me. I'm too scared to do that. We make up all the same reasons that Moses and every other prophet made. Oh, it can't be me. I can't do that. Water. Quench the spirit. Right? When he's saying, hey, do do those things that I like. Do the things that I like. Scripture, church, singing, prayer. Do those things that I like. And I'm going to help you with those things and we're going to grow together. Isn't that exciting? And you say, I've got a sin habit. I'm just not going to shake for that. I'm just not going to trade it for that. And we quench the Holy Spirit. We quench the fire. So when he burns in us, we have to act. When we refuse to let him burn, when we say no to him, we quench him. When we refuse to let, one of the ways the New Testament says very clearly, when we refuse to let him speak to us through others. That's the specific example the scripture uses. When I refuse to let God speak to me through you, I'm quenching the Holy Spirit. At that point, I need to, I need to surrender to him, surrender to his convictions, or else I quench him. Let's not quench him, but rather let's fan him into flame. Would you start with the beginning with me? Let's read this out loud. The spirit is a breath, so do not hold him. The spirit is a dove, so do not upset him. The spirit is a fire, so do not quench him. And this last one is not really a symbol in scripture, but we've given it a symbol to help us understand. The spirit is God, so do not ignore him. We've used this symbol for the Trinity for a long, 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 long time, and it's a good one because we're trying our best to understand the Godhead. But if you would now, we'll just finish up in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. So would you turn with me to 1 Corinthians 6? The Spirit is God, so do not ignore Him. Will you say that with me? The Spirit is God, so do not ignore Him. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 18. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Verse 19 says that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, would you do this? Would you turn back to chapter 3 and look at verse 16? He almost repeats this word for word, but he makes some changes here. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, do you not know that you are the temple of whom? God. Wait, I thought we were talking about the temple. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, in verse 19, verse 16 in chapter 3, do you not know that, you're, that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Chapter 3, verse 16, it's the temple of God. Chapter 6, verse 19, it's the temple of the Holy Spirit. How can both of those be true? You know the answer to that. Because the Holy Spirit is God. We say that he is the third person of the Trinity. He is not an it or a force. He is a person with uh, personal attributes throughout Scripture. We should honor him and respect him and be mindful of him just as we do to Father God and to Jesus the Son. The Spirit initiates the act of salvation. Everyone agrees on that. It's the Spirit who draws us, who whispers into our hearts, pulls us to Christ. When we become believers, He comes to take up residence inside of us in order to begin to reshape us into Christ's likeness. He's very interested in that. He seals us for the day of redemption. He gives us gifts to use to build up the congregation and to make our salvation experience real inside of us. 
He is God living in us. He is salvation alive inside of us. So if you're like me and sometimes you feel kind of dry, like you, your faith has become a set of intellectual propositions, then at that point you know that what you're looking for is life in the Spirit. Because those intellectual propositions are good and they are helpful and they may be the only thing that helps you through difficult times. But there's something else. The Holy Spirit, when he comes to live inside of us, makes salvation, the salvation experience real inside of us. And what I mean is the Holy Spirit as the down payment of the inheritance is, is a bit of the life that is to come already working itself out inside of you. And so when we begin to walk in the Spirit, it's not just an intellectual idea anymore. It is that, but it's also an actual experience. Like, I actually now can pray in the Spirit. I can hope in the Spirit. I can have faith in the Spirit. I can love in the Spirit. I can serve others in the Spirit. All the things that Christ said make up the effects of salvation are happening inside of me as I walk by the Spirit. So he comes on us not just to give us power to make a difference in the world, not just to give us a gift to use to build up the congregation, and not just to make us more like Jesus. That's very important, and he's very interested in that, the fruits of the Spirit. But also he comes into us to make the whole salvation experience real. Because having the Spirit in you, that is the essence. That is, Jesus has paid the price so that this can happen, and this is, this is real salvation at, at work, alive. And this is God alive in us. And it's just sometimes we ignore that, right? And so what we're saying is the Holy Spirit is God. And so just like Father God, and just like Jesus the Son, I need to pay attention to him. I think those are life-changing words. Pay attention. I heard one psychologist say that paying attention is the highest form of intelligence, and I thought, yeah, it's probably true. And they also have said that now we have the attention span of less than a fruit fly, I think. It's like less than five seconds or something, which is really too bad because, because we're talking about supernatural things, right? We're not talking about things that that uh, are like a cheeseburger. That's pretty, that's pretty brainless. You stick that thing in your mouth, right? You get it in your stomach as fast as you can, right? That's, that's easy, right? Things like sleep and things like pie. Those things are simple, easy. Any barbarian can enjoy those things, right? But we're talking about now the supernatural world has crossed into our world, and now in order to walk in the spirit, we're gonna have to pay attention, right? And treat him as he's got fellowship with him as God, because that is who he is. And if, so, so devotional reading, good, easy, bite-sized devotional reading, good for prayer, some learning, and now some little more hardcore theology, but still put in a way that all of us can understand by my favorite New Testament scholar, Gordon Fee, who just passed away, I think it was last year, uh, Paul the Spirit and the People of God. In this little book, he has a much bigger version of this, but I thought you would be less intimidated by this one, where he, he basically spends his time in all of Paul's texts concerning the Holy Spirit. A lot of good stuff in there just for follow-up reading. So would you help me out with this? Let's, let's start all over. Let, could you put this, the slide before this one back up? Let's start at the beginning. Everyone, the Spirit is a breath, so do not hold him. The Spirit is a dove, so do not upset him. The Spirit is a fire, so do not quench him. And the Spirit is God, so do not ignore him. And all the people said, and that's the sermon in symbols. Say, but Pastor Trey, you just created a whole lot more questions than I had when I came in here. Good. This is designed to give us an introduction, to get us thinking, to get us excited, to get us digging and eventually to get us desperate. And we're finally, we're finally tired of trying to live the Christian life under our own steam. We're finally tired of working on our issues. And we want something simpler 
and more powerful. When that happens, the stage is set for the Holy Spirit to begin to work in our life in a way that maybe he hasn't ever or he hasn't in years. The Holy Spirit is a breath, a dove, a fire. He is God. So let us stop holding, upsetting, quenching, and ignoring. Instead, let us breathe him deep, everybody. Let us be sensitive to him. Let us fan him into flame. And let us pay attention to him. Let us be a people who are filled with the Holy Spirit, the spirit of the trail. Let us take some time now to pray. A lot of thoughts have come into your mind through these symbols and these different passages of Scripture. And I want to give you just a moment to pray through those. And I want you, if you would, and you don't have a prayer that's coming to mind, if you would pray something like this, Father God, teach me about your Spirit. All over the room, let's take some time now to be quiet and to pray.